Welcome to the Founders Odyssey podcast, where we create an environment for founders to thrive through education, inspiration, and a supportive community. My name is Nathan Bird, and I will be your host today. Chris Daigle is a serial entrepreneur and has his eye for growth. He is an M&A professional in the financial publishing, fintech, and financial services space. His specialty is to help accelerate growth architectures within businesses by strategically putting them together, effective and efficient marketing strategies. His highly sought after executive coaching, mentorship, strategic planning, business development, and sales growth skill sets are much desired by corporations. With his extensive experience of building, leading, and scaling multiple teams, Chris Daigle is a wealth of knowledge and we are honored to have him on the show today. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Awesome. Absolutely. So, hey, let's just dive into it. I yep. like to have a conversational approach, like I said. And uh, what's gotten you interested in business as a whole? Um, so I think the quote is from John Doerr, Silicon Valley Scion. And it was, you're either a missionary or a mercenary. And what got me into business, I'm a mercenary, the money. Um, okay. I look at business a lot differently. I, I love what I do. So I'm fortunate in that capacity, but I look at business a little differently. Most people identify as their career or what their skill set is and that sort of thing. I simply see business as a vehicle to provide me with resources, aka money, connections, whatever, so that I can go pursue a life, right? So... I'm very, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm very committed when I'm working with someone, um, but that's usually their dream, right? I'm helping uh, a founder grow their business. <clears throat> so it's not necessarily something where I'm going to be planting my flag for years and years. So I don't mind identifying as a mercenary in the space, provided that I, I you know, have uh, some context, which is high ethics, high integrity. I know everybody says that, but if you were to uh, talk to anybody who I've done business with in the direct response to digital marketing space in the past 20 plus years, um, I can't think of one person that would say, don't do business with him, right? So the the ethics and integrity goes without saying, but I'm about the money. No, and that's really good. I And I like the way that you've described that because, you know, some people are in, the, in it for the money, but they're in it for the money based on a different outcome than what you're saying now. Your money, yes, driven, but also that money is to go towards something good, right? To help other people achieve their dreams and to make their dreams a reality. Yep. And you know that's one thing that I see from you and I commend you with that. So tell us a little bit more about some of the mentors in your life. And also let's take it back to where, when you were in college and how did you get sparked, right? Yeah, with business and you know who were some people that really inspired you in your life? Sure, um, you know I think I accidentally stumbled on entrepreneurship. I can remember being in the fifth grade and having a cigar box in my locker that just had a bunch of stuff in it: candy, erasers, keychains. And I remember realizing I didn't know what the word arbitrage meant at the time, but I remember realizing, man, I can spend a quarter on this candy bar and I can sell it for a buck. How many times can I do that? Right. So that um, was like my first aha about business or about um, being a business person and uh, scored well in, in high school on all my uh, exams and that sort of thing, got a scholarship to a small private liberal arts school and went there and just realized that I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Rushmore. And at the very beginning of Rushmore, it's a Wes Anderson film. At the very beginning of Rushmore, there is a presentation by Bill Murray. Bill Murray is a, a benefactor of the private school. And he's got all the kids sitting in there and he made a big donation. So he gets a chance to address the kids, right? And he says, um, some of you are rich. You're born that way. You're going to stay that way. For those of you who aren't, get the rich kids in your sights and take them down. So that's kind of how I, it was a joke, of course, but that's how I felt when I went off to this private liberal arts school, because uh, I didn't grow up, you know, middle-class family. Like that was, we didn't, there was no extravagances in my youth. Um, and I realized after being there for one year that this was, 
this is all rich kids. Like they don't have to be hungry. Right. And I, man, I grew up in the South and I realized, wow, it's a big world. I can do anything I want. And um, so I left school after one year, full ride, the whole deal and joined the military. What do they say? Um, uh, travel the world, meet interesting people and kill them. No, I'm kidding. That's, that's an old joke from the army. But uh, and that really was the first time in my life where um, I was forced to really leverage discipline. Right. And that takeaway for me has served me for the rest of my business, um, knowing that stick with it, provided that it's the right path, stick with it, and you will get over the hump. There will be a point where you stop running or you stop crawling in the mud or you stop sleeping on your friend's couch because your business hasn't gotten traction yet. So um, from there, uh, it really just the, the entrepreneurship accelerated once I got out of the military. I moved down to the Caribbean. I was living in St. Thomas. I ran a, one of the finest restaurants in the Caribbean down there at a time when cigars were really getting traction in the U.S. market. Uh, Cigar Aficionado had launched. And with that demand, it caused scarcity in the U.S. A lot of fine tobaccos are grown in the Caribbean. I was a hop, skip, and a jump from the Dominican Republic. I said, man, let me go fly over there. I landed in um, uh, Santo Domingo and started asking, where can I get, you know, cigars and worked my way over to the Haitian border. Uh, Santiago de los Caballeros was the town. Walked in, there was 150 people rolling cigars. I said, I'll take everything you got. Um, negotiated some terms, shipped them back to the States. Arbitrage. It was me selling candy bars from my locker once again. Uh, and that like that just further reinforced that uh, positively reinforced that like, hey, Chris, you've got uh, uh, a career here. You've got a career in figuring out this, the gaps in the marketplace and how you can facilitate um, resources here being uh, sent there, like all that type of stuff that happens as an entrepreneur. And um, got involved in my first real estate transaction when I was down there and uh, flipped a hat, like flipped a condo and was just like, oh my gosh, there's more money than I had made uh, probably in a year. I'd made it sitting at the closing table. And uh, I took that seed capital, came back to the States and, um, you know, I, I, I came back to study. I, I was dating a girl that was down there from Silicon Valley. And this was 1998. I was like, man, this computer stuff. Whoa. Like interesting things happening here. She wanted to move back to Oakland. I said, look, I'm gonna go out there with you. I'm gonna spend one year and I'm gonna learn technology, computers, whatever. And this was the dot-com bubble. And, um, Went out there, I waited tables for 11 months. The last month I was there, I got hooked up doing SAP. Um, huge enterprise resource planning software. It was high demand back then. And I think my first job, I went from waiting tables in Oakland while I was trying to figure out the tech stuff to uh, working with Accenture and being billed out at like 600 bucks an hour, right? Um, and that introduced me to entrepreneurship at scale. Because all they were doing, they weren't paying me 600 bucks an hour. They were arbitraging my skill and my time. And I was like, man, wow, selling cigars is great or candy bars from the locker is great. But these guys, if I can get five of these people build out at 600 bucks an hour and pay them 100 bucks an hour, wow. Um, and it kind of led to that. But I'll tell you, man, a big lesson was that uh, be careful what you ask for. Because I thought, man, I want to fly first class, I want to travel around the world doing, you know, high tech consulting, I want my clients to really respect me, I had all those things and I was miserable. I remember sitting in a hotel room and just being like, what is wrong? And boom, up pops a direct response TV commercial from a guy named Carlton Sheets. I don't even know if Carlton's still alive. I'm talking about how you could buy real estate and flip it and all this kind of stuff. I said, that's what I want to do. Um, bought Carlton's sheet. Carlton's Sheets product. And I think within the next 12 months, I flipped almost 50 properties. Um, it was in New Orleans. I was living there at the time. Uh, it was, there was a lot of gentrification that was occurring in certain areas and I just caught the right time. Um, and from there, what happened was I created some SaaS to help me. I didn't realize it was SaaS at the time. I just had an Indian team build out um, a, a wizard to generate legal docs for me. And uh, somebody said, hey, can I get access to that? And enough people said that. And I started charging 
20 bucks a month for unlimited access. And I remember I was at Mardi Gras 2002. I launched it, went to a parade, came back to my house and made my first sale, 20 bucks, 1995. And it just accelerated after that. And that really got me interested. I was like, hey, this is viable. How can I learn more about how to get more eyeballs to my, my software? And that led me to discovering uh, direct response marketing. I just didn't, I didn't know what that was. And a guy named Dan Kennedy, I went to an event that Dan Kennedy did. And, and Dan, if you know Dan, he's a master at, at influence and persuasion and, and copy and in marketing and in sales and that sort of thing. And um, the industry was pretty small back then as far as like the digital marketing crowd. And I just happened to always be wired to be a biz dev person. I didn't realize what that was. And I made friends with people at the events. Fast forward 20 years, those are some of the biggest names in the space. I've maintained friendships with them. And now if I need anything, it's like, I have a nickname in my industry. They call me Dr. Daigle, right? And that's because if anybody's got a problem, they call me because I'm like, you know what? I got a guy. Uh, you know what? Do you know so-and-so? Let me get you introduced. And it, um, that was kind of the path to where I am today. What I do now is a lot different. It's just a more mature, more sophisticated version of arbitrage as I did when I was in the fifth grade. So, no, I think that's very good for people to understand that, you know, there's always this, you know, you've got your profit margins, you've got uh, how to leverage specific skill sets. And that's in essence what you were doing is you were using your ability to market, but then also the ability of others, which I think is so important in business, understanding your leverage points, but then also how to lead. And then lead by example to put together those, you know, pinpoint ways that you can solve people's problems. I, I wanted to go back to something you said, and this happens in entrepreneurship with a lot of people. So they want what they conceptualize to be that dream, and they, they, they actually get that. Um, and then they ask themselves, well, what more? And they find themselves like you Ooh. were at the, you know, in that hotel Tell me a little bit more about why you felt that way. And for those out there that are listening that are at this point, how can we help them get out of that into something that may be more fulfill, uh, fulfilling? I, I think, Nathan, you just touched on something that's very important. So two things happened in my life that, that um, were kind of wake up calls for me. One of them was a mentor suggested that I determine a, a walk away number. I was like, what the hell is that? He said, it's a number it doesn't, that when you hit that number, it doesn't mean that you stop working, that you're forced to retire, but it means that you have committed to pause and reflect. Am I happy? Do I like the direction that my life is going? Um, is this enough? Uh, and because otherwise you just get on this paper chase and there's always more. And then the, the other thing that kind of really stuck with me was I was listening to Wayne Dyer and he had written a book uh, about Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher. And there was a quote from Lao Tzu that I found brilliant. And it was, when the cup is full, stop pouring. And as an entrepreneur, if you have not determined what a full cup looks like, uh, you're going to be really old one day and you're going to go, damn, I could have stopped a long time ago. Right. And, and, and do what I'm doing. Not that that's the path for everybody, but like I'm making money so that I can support my, and, and guys, like I have a nice home, but uh, this isn't about the pursuit of material consumption. When I say uh, acquiring these resources, it's so that I can pause and reflect and say, I didn't have a lot of impact, social impact earlier in my life. Is this the time for me to do that? Is there a pursuit that my wife has that I can give her the gift of being able to support that. Like, so um, those were the, the two things. And I didn't realize either of those at that moment when I was in that hotel room, when I felt, you know what it was? It was just, it was the loneliness of being on the road. I hadn't, and most entrepreneurs don't do this. I hadn't future paced. Okay, if I get everything that I'm planning, what does that look like? And most entrepreneurs, we get on the grind and we stay on the grind. And we condition ourselves to be grinders. And uh, I mean, if you want to be successful, I don't know too many entrepreneurs that are that started passively and have thrived in the business, right? Um, and I think what happens is that 
there's nobody out there suggesting to these entrepreneurs, like, why are you still grinding? Maybe you do need to, but maybe you don't need to. Do you know why you're doing this? Because one of the things that I do with a lot of executives is get them out of their own way, right? Because the gift that they've got is the ability, the, the, the ability to see things in their business that nobody else does because it's their business, right? And But what they end up doing is they end up it's almost the, the opposite of the Peter principle, if you're familiar with that. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it basically says it's a business philosophy that says people will continue to be promoted until they reach the level of their own incompetence. And what that means is that maybe you're a great salesperson. They were promote. Oh, well, of course, he'd be a great sales manager. Let's put him in charge of everybody. They promote him to the sales manager or her to the sales manager. And they're just not wired for that. Right. So, of course, they don't continue to be promoted. They were promoted to the level of their own incompetence. Um and it's almost the, the opposite of the uh, Peter principle in that um, in, instead of continuing to go for more, getting very clear on where you want to stop, right? And again, you don't have to, but having that check-in in your life already pre-committed uh, is something that I think a lot of people would... I, not just anecdotally, but consistently when I work with executives, uh, high achievers, that's one of the things they never did. They never really stopped grinding. Maybe they bought a Rolls or maybe they bought a Rolex or, but they're still grinding. They just got nicer stuff. And uh, they, they get so caught up in doing the thing that they're not thinking about the thing. And as somebody who's achieved success, you should the greatest skill that you've got is your ability to think. It's not the fact that you can code faster or your landing pages convert better. Those are all technical or artistic skills, but they're not, they're not what's going to get you to uh, a higher strata of operation and business, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, I was speaking with Benjamin Hardy this week uh, and Benjamin, we were talking about reflection Yep. And we were talking about giving yourself time to dwell. And, but then we also started to talk about how within business and also within life, we're looking for this balance. And the most savvy entrepreneurs and founders that I've seen, they, they have this confidence, but also this ability to turn it on and to also understand where they're going and why they're going, where they're going with intent. And I believe what you've said is so valuable for those out there that having that, when you, when you start pouring and you're full, then stop. <laughs> and it's very difficult for a high achieving you know, founder or right CEO to say, well, we, we can't really stop because now we've created this habit. Well, that's where that ability that you have to look inward and say, you know, and also do a course correction, right? Reflection, refuel, and then a refocus. You know, that's something that I like to integrate in a lot of what we do. But so I, I just wanted to say, I agree with you on that. And, you know, also when we look at reflect, it's almost like we need to reflect times 10, we are in a culture right now that's 10x everything. Yeah. And if we don't 10x reflection, where will we be? You know, we'll be in that cycle just like you're talking about that is so continuous that we create our own habit and we haven't taken that time of reflection. So thank you for outlining that in a very succinct manner. You know, I'm excited really here to talk to you more about you know, what is presently exciting you and some of the things that, cause you said, you know, that's almost past and some of the things you've learned from that. So let's hop into the present. Sure. And what are some things that you're learning, you know, as you do your uh, consulting with companies and, you know, what are some of the things that are really standing out to you that you're learning? Yeah. Um, two, two key things that I, that I know have a lot of impact when I work with a client that, I enjoy doing one of them is the introduction of an operating system into your business. And what I mean by that, if, if any of you are familiar with EOS or Vern Harnish has his scaling up model, 
Uh, Ryan Dice at Digital Marketer has scalable OS. Uh, plenty of information about how Google uses OKRs and that sort of thing and other companies as well. So if you haven't done that, folks, I would suggest that you read the book Traction or just go to YouTube and type in, type in EOS Worldwide and watch a couple videos. It was the most logical approach to uh, business operations that I've ever seen before. Um, and we can get into that a little bit more if, if that's of interest. Uh, and the other thing that excites me is I have a mentor. His name is Roland Frazier. And I helped Roland at the beginning of um, uh, COVID. Roland launched a program teaching uh, what Walker Diebel calls acquisition entrepreneurship. It's essentially, it's M&A for the little guy, right? It's the opportunity to grow through expansion, but not necessarily need to be an MBA and not necessarily need to have a whole bunch of cash uh, ready to deploy. It was creative negotiation with other small businesses so that you can uh, get control and leverage their assets, okay? And one of the things that, uh, and over the course of the past couple of years, I think I've probably advised 1,200 entrepreneurs on either an entry or an exit strategy for a business. So I, I saw every scenario, um, that sort of thing. And one of the things that uh, seemed to be a very high leverage activity was understanding multiple arbitrage. If you're categorized as a cat food maker, and there's a multiple that, that the industry pays for cat food businesses, right? If you are a SaaS business, there's a multiple that people pay for SaaS, and it's a lot higher than what they pay for more traditional businesses like publishing or uh, depending on the consumer product good, like, I don't know, shoes or something. Um, so there's ways that as you are building your business, if you've done a good job of being a leader and you're thinking out to the future, at some point, exit is inevitable. The business will fail. You will die. Somebody will buy it right? Like you're going to exit your business regardless. And understanding that when that exit opportunity exists, if I'm categorized as a low multiple business, all that work I've done for the past X number of years will be rewarded, but at a multiple that's a standard for my industry categorization. Now, if three years prior, I would have introduced an app to my business and, and not just have an app, but have it be part of the part of the, the deliverable, part of the value for the customer, right? Add an app, maybe introduce some sort of like a, 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 a subscription online to a physical product or a digital product or whatever. All of those things result in that cat food business now being recategorized into possibly SaaS or possibly you know some other category that has a much higher multiple, same business, same client avatar, but because you were strategic about how you, the product lines that you introduced or the narrative that you uh, controlled in the marketplace about what your company was, that results in you being able to say, whoa, 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 private equity, investment banker, private investor, whatever, we're not a cat food company, we're a blank, right? And that doesn't require, and worst case scenario, your business is better off because you were thinking in, like, about what's going to happen in three years with your business. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's like, it's such a simple move to make, but it goes, it's, it's in line with that saying, the best time to plant the tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is right now, right? Because the time, the next three years is going to pass, whether you do this to your business or you don't do it to your business. So my suggestion would be introduction of an operating system and follow it because investors see that and they see less risk. They've got their stuff documented. Uh, they're tracking the right things. They've got their procedures and processes. Like there's no dancing bear. If somebody, if the key man dies, that's okay because the business doesn't need him. Do that and recategorize your business. Those two things right there will result in a much more favorable outcome when private equity starts knocking or your biggest competitor says, hey, we're looking to scale through acquisition. Are you interested, right? Yeah, I, I think, you know, and based on what, what you're saying, we've got 
just to make sure that you're looking at the end in mind, of course, yeah. and a lot of people, sometimes they'll, they'll not look at the end in mind, but they're also, they'll also keep their mindset small um, because that's all they really see. Yeah. And, you know, having yeah. those outward, uh, you know, kind of consultants and people from the outside to give them the perspective that you help people with is extremely valuable to set that foundation and to set that, you know, your business pillars on more of a long-term uh, growth multiple strategy. And yeah. that's where that reflection time is so important to make yep. sure that we can, you know, go back in time and see how things are shifting. Because when you build a business, as we all know, it's an ebb and a flow. There is, you know, one thing that's moving this thing that moves the other. And if, if we're not having that, you know, weekly, monthly, quarterly check-ins based on the end result here for from a three to five year exit, depending on what industry you're in. So this weekend I was speaking with a uh, Jim quick and Jim, yep. you know, we were going through patterns and what he does is he, he really focuses in on finding patterns quickly within companies. And I feel that what you're saying is, is really in line with what he's saying as well to increase the overall value and understanding of the systems inside of that corporation. To increase the overall multiple for your, you know, long-term strategy. So, could you explain just a little bit of some of the problems that you've identified in companies that haven't systematized their approach to this long-term value yeah. and increased multiple? Yeah. So, there's a couple of pretty standard um, things that I'll, I'll notice when I'm starting to work with a company. One of them is. The leadership team doesn't, they're not all on the same page as far as where the company's going dollar wise, right? Like, and not to just, even though I, I am an admitted mercenary, I'm not boiling everything down to the dollar amount, but let me give you an example. If I go into and I, I start my process and I say, okay, guys, in five years from now, where is the company as far as revenue? And you got a CFO that says 20 million. You got a CEO that says a hundred million and everybody else on the team is somewhere in between. I want you to think about what that means is that if we don't have clarity on where we're going, the CFO is making decisions based on a $20 million outcome. That's a different decision that you'd make on a hundred million dollar outcome, right? Which the CEO in this scenario has. So one of the first things I do is I get them to put that number, like, what is it guys? And they, they kind of look at each other and they're like, oh, I, I didn't know you were thinking that number. So that level of clarity, something as small as that, it's one of the first things I do is we do a whole process where we get them very clear on outcome and what that's going to look like and why. Um, and the second thing that I do, and you referenced this earlier about the 10X. For whatever reason, most of us, if I asked you, hey, Nathan, what's, what, would, what would it, if you were going to do a business and it was going to do big numbers, what would that be? you've got a number in your head, right? Where that number came from, it's from social conditioning, it's from experiences that you've had, your peer group or whatever. But what your peer group's not saying, they're not saying, hey, Nathan, that's great, but how do you 10X that, right? I don't know. This is that reflection. This is what, what Keith Cunningham calls thinking time, right? Like, if you're not asking yourself that question, and it's not just about, I don't want people to think it's at the expense of anything else in your business just for growth. It's not the case at all. There's that you can have the growth and do it healthy, sustainably without it being chaotic. But if you're not asking yourself, how do I 10 X? Cause here's, what's going to happen. You start asking that question. And I can remember the first time a mentor asked me that took me, he, he, at the end of our call, he said, Oh, and by the way, how do you 10 X your business? Call me when you figure that out. Click. I was like, oh, two weeks. I'd be like uh, in the shower, walking the dog. Like, how do I? And I remember being at a stop sign and it hit me, right? And it didn't result in me 10Xing the business, but it did result in me like 4Xing my business just from making a decision about how I was going to position things. But if I wouldn't have been asking that question, I wouldn't have, that, that wouldn't have magically come to me, right? So most of you who um, are running businesses challenge your definition of big when it comes to what's possible with your business, not because 
if you don't do it, you're a failure or, or you're not a successful business person, but because it's going to make you ask different questions than you're asking yourself day to day right now. And the answers to those questions will result in breakthroughs when it comes to uh, velocity, velocity of scale, of scale. size of scale, uh, whatever the question is, but how do I, how do I 10 X my blank? So, and not to borrow 10 X, it can be, whatever, but don't, don't try to, here's how you double your business guys work twice as hard, right? There's no paradigm shift that occurs, but for you to go from to doubling the business to five or six X, the business or 10 X, the business, you have to create a new paradigm that makes your old paradigm obsolete. That's a quote from Buckminster Fuller, but that's how you win. You, you, but if you're, if you're asking how to double it, you're going to come up with some tactical bullshit. If you are forcing yourself to really like, oh, wow, look at things asymmetrically, you're going to come up with a much better way of doing your thing. So that's the two things I look at with companies mainly. Yeah, I'm glad you kept it simple because I'm sure there's so much more behind that uh, than you can even imagine and those out there. Yeah, you know, that's why we that's why we've got Chris on here and you can reach out to him. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about that in regards to clients is sometimes you got to get rid of clients uh, that aren't matching your long-term strategy and a cultural fit. And sometimes the more you say no, the more you grow. And it's so counterintuitive to everything around you, but that means that you can get more clear on your customer and, you know, this is directly from the Swan Group, uh, who, if, if you guys know Chris Voss, he's a, he used to be an F FBI negotiator, uh, one yep. of the world's, you know, leaders in that. And he's created a consulting company that really has measured how you, how you take in bad clients and then how many bad clients uh, will, will take down you know, one good client. So yeah. there's a whole equation there, but anyway, yeah, just saying no. And um, so let's see, the future is looking bright for Chris, um, but I want you to explain to our audience out there what that future looks like and what's really got you excited. Um, it's, it's, it's something that I, um, and it looked at me, uh, probably saying no to new business and diving deep with one client in particular who has the all of the makings for them to be a, a huge enterprise and when we when we they reached out to me because again being dr daigle they had they had had some rapid growth and it was causing pain and it was uh, preventing them from being the company they wanted to be. They weren't delivering the way that they wanted to, and they were looking for a solution. So they they brought me in just to, to be the guy who's not in their box and looking at things like, well, why are you doing it this way? And the culture that they had there was fantastic. Um, the product quality, fantastic. Uh, the 50-year the history of, of this business was fascinating and just a lot of things that I liked about the people and and that first meeting that we had where I share like okay guys where are we going the number that they determined was we want to get to 300 million dollars per year in gross revenue within the next five years at the time they were at 20 million dollars per year sounds like a lot of growth in five years but it was exactly as predicted this person wanted to hit 500 million this person was happy with 100 this person was happy with where we were so getting like, once we did that, I've spent the last maybe nine months really uh, integrating EOS and like a, a modified version of EOS into their business. And they're getting some significant traction now. They doubled last year. This year will more than double again. Uh, so they're right on track. But I think that what I'm going to do is I've, I've participated in businesses that are that big, but not as intimately as I'm doing now. And for me in my career, um, I've always kind of been the hired gun. The I, my teams are have always my internal teams have always been small uh, by choice. 
but something happened and I wanted to take on the challenge of becoming the person that could lead a company to $300 million, 500, whatever the number is, right? But, but learn the skill sets that I hadn't been forced to learn in the past. The stuff about dynamic team leadership and, and building teams and getting teams to communicate and uh, understanding the multiple arbitrage, like more sophisticated business uh, tactics than I had ever done before. So the future for me, if, if things continue to operate the, the way that they will, would be for me to, to be, to continue to work with this company, take them to 300 million, but as not as an outsider, but as like a, a part of the family, um, and, and like immerse myself in the study of, uh, being a CEO, being an effective leadership. And I know that a CEO, you can be a CEO of your company and you guys are doing a million bucks a year. That's fantastic. But the requirements to, to lead and deal with a team and deal with the public and deal with the media and all that type of stuff at an enterprise that's, that's that big, because with the, with the multiple arbitrage game that we're playing, that $300 million in gross revenue is going to result in a very tasty valuation at the end of those, well, at this point, four years left. And to be somebody who can participate at that scale would, would be, uh, it's, not, it's not an ego thing. I don't need it from like my, my pedigree. And I, it wouldn't necessarily be about the money, although the, the payoff would be significant. But I wasn't feeling challenged necessarily. Um, and this, I, I've, I've manufactured an environment of challenge for myself by committing to that role. And, and that's the thing that I'm most excited about is the growth that I've been going through and will continue to go through because of the mandate that I set for myself. Mm, that's so good. You know, you've, you've taken a step uh, forward and you have, like you said, manufactured what this challenge will look like in your life. And many people out there, uh, I don't think they're challenging themselves enough. And just like you said, well, you've got to understand what 10x would look like. And, and um, you know, I, I can remember when I worked with a friend of mine who had, you know, just considerable amount of money in his bank account, right? It was like over 100 million. Okay. And when you have enough capital to do anything you want, anywhere, anytime with anyone, your mind thinks differently. Then you're a start. Then you're just a struggling founder startup who's not knowing what to do. You start taking shots like you wouldn't believe when you have all the backing in the world, right? So it's the same with understanding this "what if" principle and placing that future self that you're stepping into through challenges to unlock this unlimited potential yes. that's inside of you all the time. Yes. It's in its, it's in, it's insane how with that one thought process you can completely transform your life. Yep. So, you know, once again, I just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today. Thanks, nice. It's been enlightening. Um, you know, obviously from business and tactics and just a few little nuggets there that you placed and understanding, you know, what a business really needs, but then also your future and how you're developing and maturing as a businessman. And, you know, every day, each one of you out there is maturing in your own light and, you know, taking and learning from people that are older, people that are younger. Uh, don't ever cut yourself off based on the perceptions that you have of who that person is, what knowledge they may have, because you never know when that nugget of information will come out. So one last thing, what legacy do you want to leave on the earth? You know, man, um, I'm not attached to, uh, to that. Okay. And what I mean by that is that like, I, my belief is that we're part of something much bigger and that what we do here is a drop in the bucket uh, when you consider cosmic time or universal time or whatever. So the only legacy that I, I would 
care about leaving would be making sure that my family is better off. I, I don't mean like better off than I'm dead, but but they're better off than had I not been in their lives. If I if I inspired curiosity in the in my kids, if I um, I don't know gave my wife opportunities to pursue a creative interest that most people wouldn't have time to do because they had to go do the nine to five or whatever. Like those are the things that I would feel that had led me to be quote unquote successful in this life. That's good. Well, I mean, right now um, we're creating content. We're co-creating content to inspire yeah. others to be more creative. Cool. Yeah. To go after what they dream of. Yeah. And it's interesting because when you say family, family can be, you know, anyone Absolutely, who's watching brother. this. Anyone yep. who's a part of all of your brand building, anyone who's a part of your, obviously your inner circle is completely different, but that's what's so neat because we all are in this together. And I don't mean to say that uh, you get it, but uh, so anyway, thank you once again, Chris. My and, pleasure. Uh, this has been the Founders Odyssey podcast. If you guys like this episode, feel free to subscribe and also share with your friends. And until next time, look back and all of our uh, different episodes that we've shot they they are both on youtube as well on spotify and other places you can find this podcast thank you once again and we look forward to seeing you awesome. again. thanks everybody